Okay, and thank you for joining Career Innovations um, Q&A session. This session will be recorded. It's uploaded to our growing YouTube channel. You can go to our YouTube channel, Career Innovations, all one word, and actually look at any missed sessions that you may have had. Um, you will find us, um, again, under Career Innovations on One Word. Um, you can ask questions one or two ways, depending on how you lo log into the workshop. If you were able to dial the number and log in via the phone, um, you're able to unmute your mic or, rate or actually a cue that you want your mic unmuted. If you actually uh, logged in via the web, you can raise your hand or you can, um, and I can unmute your mic and you can ask your question that way. I really do urge that people send their questions prior to the workshop. That way um, I can definitely elaborate more on some of the things that we're going to talk about. It's not going to be an answer that I'm pulling out the air. I've done some research, so I really do encourage people to send their um, their questions prior to the workshops that, to the, so they can be included on the slides. Today's topic, we're going to talk about maximizing your job search efforts. Again, this is a Q&A session. The topic changes depending on the um, questions that you send me. Um, and I actually had a question that was sent to me, and I'm going to elaborate more on that as we move through the slides. But first, I'd like to give everyone about a 30-second overview of who I am, what I do, and you know who we are. What is Career Innovations? Well, I'm Bridget Bagg, and I'm actually the founder of Career Innovations. That's the picture of me up there. Um, we're an executive search firm. We were actually launched in 2007. We're a referral-based firm, and we pride ourselves in using innovative technology and tools to locate some of the best talent for our clients. Um, on top of doing staffing and recruiting, um, we also provide other services to job seekers as well as um, employers. One of the things that you're utilizing now is the job search or the job seeker training sessions. We also do HR sessions as well. Um, I wanted to find a way that we can actually give back to some of the candidates that we do um, receive that do reach out to us to send us a re their resumes but we're unable to place uh, maybe that we, we're not working on a particular opening um, it can be any reason why we have not um, been able to engage them with any of our clients so we wanted to find some type of platform to at least give them the tools and the resources to go out there and market themselves uh, another thing that we do is resume writing and editing we do career coaching we do market research market research can go for the candidate or the employer side this actually goes out to look for, you know, companies that are are researched for the parameters that you send us as far as demographics, job title, pay. Um, and we go out there and find the research for you, find the decision makers, and we give that information to you, which hopefully you'll use to leverage your relationship with those decision makers. We also do compensation benchmarking, referral, and retention workshops. I like to start off each session with a quote. Today's quote, there are two ways of meeting difficulties. You alter the difficulties or yourself to meet them. And we're going to talk about some difficulties that you may encounter as you're going through the job search or as you're either, you know, maybe gainfully employed, you may be trying to um, obtain that promotion or make a lateral move. You know, we're going to talk about some of the difficulties that you may have. This is going to actually go to my first point that I was um pretty much uncovering uh, when I was telling you about I, I had someone reach out to me on on LinkedIn and, and they had a question regarding their job search and this particular person which I'll leave anonymous was um, you know looking for a new job they've been out of work for almost a year you know coming up on a year I should say and they wanted some pointers from me um, and I thought that this question that they asked it took me some time to put put together a very um, an informative and detailed answer that I thought this is something I wanted to include in the workshop because I'm pretty sure there's someone on the line that may be dealing with this. What we're going to learn um, and what people learn as they, they start to look for jobs is that there's determining factors that are involved, you know, in what you're looking for, what your success rate is going to be and how long it's going to take you to get there. And this question that they asked me was, um, 
they've been looking for jobs um, for about a year now, since last year around this time, um, June, July. They applied to close to 200 jobs within that time frame, and they hadn't found anything. And the person asked me, okay, is this something that's normal? And I said, well, normal, you know, that really depends on what you define as normal. And I also put some stats in there. According to the BLS, which is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it can take anywhere from three to nine months to land a job in this current economy. You know, over time, experts has, um, have actually estimated that it can take roughly one month to find a job for every $10,000 that you want to receive or you want to earn. You know, of course, none of this is written in stone. You know, this is very subjective to the candidate situation, you know, what they're prioritizing, even their efforts. Uh, this all plays a role on how long this is going to take. But I also gave them examples of I've worked with candidates that, you know, they were looking for a job and within a matter of weeks they landed their position. I've also worked with candidates that, you know, are going on two or three years finding a job. You know, but I wanted them to keep in mind that, again, there are other things that determine this. And these were two factors that I'd like to do to discuss tonight, you know, and I think these are the most predictive factors and I call these the double D's, you know, is your demand and your demographics. You know, you're first going to look at the demand, you know, regardless of what industry that you in, that you're in or that you're trying to pursue, it has a demand, whether the demand is high or whether it's non-existent. You know, it still has something. It still has a number out there that is um, correlated to that particular industry. That's something that you're going to have to find out by doing your research. So these are the questions that you're going to have to ask yourself when you're looking at the demand. Are, the, are your current skill set or the job that you're trying to pursue, is it in demand? And more importantly, is it in demand in your area? You know, it, this may be, you may be in a particular role that may be booming somewhere else, but that doesn't help you if you're not willing to relocate or if they're not providing any type of um, remote opportunities. So you have to consider that as well. The next biggest factor I think that works hand in hand with the demand is the demographics. You know, what is your geographic flexibility? You know, are you willing to move? If you've been statin in a place where you're not making any type of movement, you're not growing. In fact, you may not even be getting traction as far as interviews or feedback from employers because maybe what you're trying to pursue, you know, is non-existent or the need for that particular role is not there. That's when the question has to come into play. Are you willing to make a move? Are you willing to cast a wider net to see what's out there in other places? These are the two determining factors I think that will determine, first of all, how long your, how long your job search is going to be and how effective it's going to be. If you live in a small town and, you know, the closest major city is 30, 40 miles away, and you're finding that those, those are where all the positions are, you know, are you willing to either make that commute or are you willing to relocate? You know, and I've seen a lot of people because of different reasons. It may be that, hey, I have a house, my family's here, my kids are in school. It's different reasons on why people can't move. These are things or these are factors that really determine whether or not, you know, landing a job is going to be something that's going to take you that three to nine month window. Is it going to take you only a handful of weeks or is it something that's going to be stretched out to one or two year period? Next thing we're going to look at are some other factors that play a huge role in landing a job. Um, some other factors I actually presented was tenacity and persistence. You know, many people won't touch on this topic. Many people won't say your efforts really, you know, determine <laughs> your outcome, even though in some people's mind, okay, this is a no-brainer. Many people won't touch on this topic because it's something that's very hard to measure. You know, how can you measure someone's efforts accurately? 
you know, and does the amount of time and effort devoted to a job search, does that automatically correlate with landing the job faster? You know, it's some people that may be applying every day and not making any movement, and it can be someone that's not applying as much that lands an interview and an opportunity and a job offer within a couple weeks. No, again, this is something that's very hard to measure, and when you say effort, you're going to have to make that make that some type of quantitative value. What do you mean by effort? You know, is LinkedIn effort? Is applying on job boards effort? Is networking effort? If so, how much of each activity do I do to make my effort, quote unquote, count? You know, and when this person told me that they did about 200 jobs a year, I went ahead and elaborate on, well, you know, $200, 200 jobs wasn't a lot. You know, somebody, you know, outside looking in may say, well, that's that's a lot of jobs. But if you really do the math, and I've actually worked with a candidate that that did this particular strategy, implemented it, and was successful with it, if a person devoted their energy to apply to jobs, network, actually, you know, somehow put themselves into, put themselves in front of five to seven jobs a day, either online, reaching out to the decision maker, applying, and they said, I'm going to, every day, I'm going to apply myself to either set, you know, to five to seven jobs, you know, and you did that for one month, you know, 30 days, you know, that's equivalent to anywhere between 150 to 210 jobs a month, you know, and this particular, um, writer, you know, that's how much they did within a year. So if you look at it on that scale, that's not a lot, especially if, you know, if someone put in that effort for the whole month can do that within 30 days. You know, and then the question comes, you know, well, if I do this, you know, many people are going to question, what if there's not five to seven jobs to apply to every day? No, which is a major concern. If you're in a particular area, well, you know, they're not posting five to seven new jobs in your industry every day. You know, that could be, you know, a roadblock. But then again, it goes back to those most predictive factors. When we talked about your double Ds, your demographics and your demand. You know, that goes back to, are you willing, again, to reach out outside of your network, outside of your demographics? Are you willing to re relocate to an area where your skills are in demand? And this includes places that you may not be willing to move to. But the demand may be there. These are things that you have to consider. Um, your network is another big player uh, that determines, you know, your success on landing the job. Um, I know some people say, well, they network aggressively. I, I go to these networking events, you know, I apply to these jobs, I reach out to the decision makers, and then I ask them, you know, what do you consider networking? And I've had in my slide, sending an email requesting assistance or inquiring about an open job is not networking. You know, attending a job fair to collect business cards is not networking. You know, networking kicks in after that, after you break the ice, after you get them to commit to that, that call of action, which may be that phone call or that coffee or that lunch, you know, that, that lunch, um, lunch introduction or 15 minutes on the phone, an informative interview. When you get them to actually commit to some type of call of action, that that's something I would consider as networking. It takes nothing to respond to an email. In many cases, or some cases I should say, many don't even respond back to the email. So you want to make sure that you, when you say you're networking or you reaching out into your network, that you really are making that effective and it's something that makes sense. Um, also, if you reach out to your network, and I, I, I know in past workshops I talk about leveraging your network, and you may have a network that may not be helping you. No, I reach out to my network, I'm really not getting any traction with my network. 
You know, if your network is not giving you any type of traction, you know, or your network isn't, you know, responding, I, I, as I say, a fallen network is expected when a strong network was never in place to begin with. So you really have to ask yourself, you know, how invested were the people that you were connected with? Now, and if you're not getting a response, you know, silence is communication. You know, they're communicating you, communicating with you that they can't help. Regardless of why they can't help, that's up to interpretation. You know, maybe they're not, you know, maybe they're not the decision maker. Maybe they don't have any control over who gets hired. Maybe they're not in a position to influence the decision maker. Maybe they don't have the resources. They don't have the opening. Some just blatantly don't want to help. Some can help but won't. But regardless of the reason, you have to get past that. Leverage their silence. Leverage their non-commitment to reach out to others in the industry to start building a network that's going to be able to help you reach a higher level professionally. Um, next thing you want to look at is your solution. You know, so through your networking, through your marketing efforts, through all this tenacity that you're putting into place, are you offering a solution? Are you answering the question, why should an employer hire you? What makes you different from the other three, the 500 resumes that apply? You know, and your your solution includes, in combination with your experience, includes your education, includes your past um, projects and, and resources that you've used and implemented within your, your past organization. That all is under the solution umbrella. But are you marketing it? And one thing that you want to look at with regarding your network and your solution, how do you plan on getting this out to your network or to the people that you are starting to bring in your network? So, again, these are some factors that you do want to consider when you're doing this to make sure that you are getting the results that you want and it's driving you towards success. I actually shared this on my last um, workshop, and I have another slide in here that's going to tell you a little bit. It's not the next one, but it's the following that's going to tell you to, um, for a question that was asked about marketing. And I'm actually going to put that out there um, for people to check out um, in their own time. It's a recording. This particular slide is talking about the job search breakdown and the weekly commitment that you should have or try to strive to when you're looking for a job. Um, again, what got you here 10 years ago won't get you there today. Um, so a lot of things have changed and I'm seeing a lot of uh, um, people are finding jobs through committing through either volunteer work, networking, knowing someone, you know, things of that nature. So when I talk about your job search breakdown in my last um, slide, I talked about um, increasing your network and sending emails is not really quote unquote networking. It's really not. You know, so when I tell you to take a look at the weekly commitment, and I say 12 to 16 hours a day, and you say, oh, my goodness, that's a lot. You know, but think about it. You know, if you're not going to work, this is how much you use. This is the amount of time you usually would invest if you if you had a full time job. You know, and again, this actually includes your commute time and, you know, any work that you would have to bring home and blah, 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 blah. So it's about it averages out from 12 to 16 hours. You know, and that's if you, again, are actually devoting yourself to looking for that next opportunity. You know, you should be spending anywhere from two or three hours online. That's anywhere from 14 to 21 hours a week. That's your job boards, your social media, your research, follow-ups, emails, things of that nature that actually can be done before or after business hours. Because guess what? These platforms aren't going anywhere. 
you can get this done right when you wake up in the morning before everyone gets in the office or you can do it, you know, after everyone leaves. You know, and I really, and I've, I've said this in past workshops, I really do um, recommend people put some type of automated systems in place, especially for your social media um, and your emails that you can use and streamline this to cut your time in half. You know, there are things that you can use for social media to post. Um, same thing with responders for emails. And a lot of these resources, when you're not using it on a commercial level, are actually free. Um, next thing, you should be spending the, the bulk of your day between networking and doing some type of community service, um, taking a class, attending any type of workshop, something that's going to enrich you on a professional level, but also put you in the position that you're networking with like mind people. You can't network with people when you're behind a computer for eight to 10 hours. And, you know, and virtually networking is not the same as actually being able to physically put a face with a name and build, you know, that relationship on, on a more uh, human interaction basis. So when you are networking, you want to use it most of your time, again, looking for those industry related conferences, attending those associations and organizations. Um, if you can't make it to a physical um career fair because I know there are a lot of career fairs that they're now making it um, making it um, convenient for people that can't physically go there. You can still submit your resume and still network and engage the decision maker via the online platform. So they're still making it, you know, something that you can engage in, even though you may not physically be able to go to these career fairs. They're called virtual career fairs. And many physical career fairs still have a virtual component in which you can utilize in case you, you know, may have been a company that was there that you wasn't able to stop by and see. You know, pro professional networking meetup groups. You know, and again, be careful about that. You don't want to waste your time. And we'll talk about that on the um, on the following slide. You don't want to waste your time in organizations or networking events that really aren't challenging you and, and pushing you towards your goal. There are a lot of networking events out there or a lot of events that use the word networking in it, but really aren't, you know, cultivating any type of relationships on a professional level. Now, yeah, they're fun to attend, but you want, don't want to waste your time if it's not going to, again, secure some type of full-time employment. Next thing, volunteer community service and training. You know, this is something that you should be doing whether or not you're employed or unemployed. Now, I think that, you know, just as um, a human, humanitarian, I love to give back whether I'm looking for a job or not. And this really does reflect in a person's character and employers take note of that when they find out that you are, you, you do give back to the community, you volunteer, and it's a great way to meet like-minded people that may actually have an opportunity for you. Training, that should be something that you should be doing while you're looking for a job anyway. What are some ways that you can maximize your current skill set that can give you that competitive edge that those employers are looking for? Invest in that. And it doesn't have to be a brick and mortar school. You don't have to go to the University of XYZ to do this. There's a lot of free services out there, and now everything's becoming virtual. You could take a virtual class for no cost. You know, so you want to definitely take a take a look at some of the training and some of the resources that are out there that you can leverage to keep your mind active and keep your skill set active through this transition. You know, so once you start to see what your day looks like, you can start to, again, delegate some of the tasks that you need to do and put it in the right categories according to priority. Again, Applying to jobs online, following up to emails that aren't urgent, things like that. And again, that shouldn't be the bulk of your day. And unfortunately, when I speak to a lot of job seekers, it is. That's what they're working in a majority of the day. They're stuck on that computer. 
instead of actually engaging with some of these decision makers face to face. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Maximizing your job search efforts. The whole reason why we're having this um, particular workshop is I'm going to give you some pointers on that. And they're pretty much straightforward. The first thing that you want to do, you want to do your research. And I know a lot of people are maybe on the line that's, you know, at a point where they're frustrated, you know, they're feeling hopeless, they're not getting the results they're looking for. Um, and I think that a lot of people are going forward without a plan, which means they haven't done the number one thing that I have on this slide is research. And that goes back to the very first slide that I had, knowing where your industry is in demand, you know, planning a plan that you can actually put into action that's going to generate some results, which means that you know the companies that are hiring, you know the people that are going to be over the hiring process, you know how to get in contact with them, and you're starting to have some type of meaningful dialogue that can get you closer to that interview. You know, and that goes to my next one, having a plan of action. A lot of people are shooting in the dark right now. You know, they're putting in those keywords online, just applying to, to jobs that, you know, it looks fine. But they're not really following up. They're not tracking their efforts. So you don't know what's working. You're just frustrated that you've been doing it for a long time, but you really don't know what's working and what's not because you're not tracking anything. Because if you were tracking something, you'll be able to alter what you're doing to generate a different result. And I see a lot of people may be frustrated because they are doing the same thing and they're expecting something different to happen. And that's not the case. In order to make the effective tweaks to your plan of action, you have to track it. You have to know, hey, I did this. This didn't happen. What could I have done differently? I sent an email. They're not responding to email. Let me pick up the phone this time. Let me set up a date that we can meet up maybe for lunch or coffee. And the last thing, you want to do some type of follow-up. This goes for your networking events. This goes for um, when you apply to jobs. And then one question I did ask the young lady is, you know, out of all the jobs they apply for, how many companies did she actually follow up with? You know, if you haven't got that, that cookie cutter email saying that, you know, they found other prospects or they're moving on with other candidates, are you following up with these jobs that you're applying to? Don't tell me you're applying to hundreds of jobs, but you're really not going back to figure out where I am in the hiring process or if I'm even in it. If not, why not? What do I need to go back and change? What's preventing me from moving forward? So this is the time that you actually want to be honest with yourself. You want to get yourself out of that comfort zone. When to start making some solid connections that you could, that can put you in front of people that really make the decisions in those companies. And this is also the time to reevaluate the way that you're marketing yourself, which means you need may need to take a look at that resume or that cover letter, or may may need to relook at the jobs that you're applying to, or may need to re relook at your entire solution. You know what are you trying to get across to these decision makers? Now, how are you solving a problem at their organization? Is it something that's realistic and feasible? You know, so these are some of the things that you have to ask yourself, and this is how you're going to maximize your job search efforts. 
a question that was asked to me was tips to market yourself as a um, innovative professional for organizations. That was one of the questions that I did receive prior um, to the workshop. And I put this on here because I did a whole segment on um, marketing yourself. Um, and whenever you get a chance, I'm going to go over this slide as quickly as possible because a lot of this stuff that I talked about is um, you're going to get pretty much a, a, a good overview and more detailed presentation. If you can go to our YouTube channel, our channel is Career Innovations, all one word. If you actually go there and I and to make this easy for you so you be able to uh, pick out this particular presentation by the, the cover art, it's in the spotlight, getting employers' attention. And it has the two spotlights coming together. So this particular um, picture you see right here, this is what the first slide looks like. And that's going to be what's going to be um, on the YouTube video. So all you have to do is go to our YouTube channel, Career Innovations on One Word, click on this particular um, recording. And this is going to give you more detailed information than which I'm going to give you a quick overview for some, for people that may be on the line and want to know this. Again, I really urge you to go to that um, that recording. That's going to give you a pretty much an hour overview, an hour in depth detail on how to get you in the employer's attention. But the first thing you want to look at is your marketing one on one, um, your product, place, price, and promotion. And again, your product is you know what you have to offer. You know, the place is how you're going to get that that out to the public. Um, your price is going to be your compensation. And again, don't be so hung up on compensation being only um, salary. You know, this includes the entire package. And your promotion is how do you plan on getting it out there? How do you plan on promoting what you have to offer or that product per se? You know, so... Promotion is getting your, your your message out there, you know, besides your resume, cover letter, applying online, what are some other marketing tools or, um, or initiatives you're going to take to get yourself out there. And you want to make sure that um, when you do this, you are getting yourself in front of the right people. That's when place comes into to play. You have a lot of people that go to these job seeker workshops and they'll network with other unemployed people all day. And I never understood that. You know, I understand that you network with other people, but you want to make sure that you're going to network with people that can, you know, that, that actually hopefully are gainfully employed that can, you know, put you in in someone's ear for an opportunity. And at the end of the day, as you go down to the further on the slide, you want to sell a solution. That means you want to be very specific about what you're offering. And what I mean um, be specific with that, you want to make sure that you are letting people know exactly what you do and how you can bring value to their organization. On top of that, you want to come across as an expert. You know, if you are unconvincing and you don't have the confidence to sell your solution, I'm not going to believe you, even if you can do the job. So you want to make sure that you're you're being an expert and you're actually emphasizing on any type of past and how your past solutions can be something that they can put in place for the future of their organization. Okay, let's look at the sidebars that I have here. I know it's a long day. I know um, it's Memorial Day a weekend, and a lot of people are probably um, very tired um, or um, are just finishing eating that 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 Memorial Day dinner. So I'm going to go go through these um, pretty quick so we can get to the next slide. The next thing, you want to be your own salesperson. You 
So I have in here, the most effective marketer knows how to position his or her product and advertise all the benefits that are relevant to the needs of the buyer. That's no different, different than what you're doing when you're reaching out and trying to sell your solution to the employer, which means you're trying to sell you. You're your biggest asset. So in order for you to be able to advertise as benefits, you're first are going to have to find out what are the needs of the buyer. That's when that research comes in, when I went through the slides on doing your research. Because once you know what's required, or what's needed to get that company to the next level, you can tailor your pitch or tailor your solution to that organization's needs. There's no different when you're selling a service or product to a consumer. You find out what their problem is, and your product or service is going to be that solution. It's no different. So you have to be your own salesperson. Next, you want to network with a purpose. And we talked about this in the last slide. You want to make sure that you're networking constantly and aggressively with other professionals, but you're also staying focused and you're following up. And you're, and you're networking um, and attending events, again, that are going to challenge you professionally and take you to the next level. Not all networking events are created equal. And I'm pretty sure there are probably people on the line that have been to networking events that panned out to be a waste of time. So you want to make sure what you're getting into and are you willing to put effort in something or spend that amount of time at something that really is not going to generate the results that you're looking for. On top of emphasizing your past solutions, you want to also be future focused. That means you're going to leverage that past experience that you have, those past successes that you have, and you're trying to convince the potential employers that the knowledge that you've gained from past employers will help their industry move forward in the future. You want to be that visionary person. Paint them a picture of, hey, if I worked here, look what I can do, because this is what I did. That's what being future focused is about. You know, and again, finally, you want to have those testimonies and referrals. I put those in there. And I don't know if anyone's ever shopped for anything new or service or product. You know, the first thing they want to do is look, they, they, they look up reviews on it. I know I do. I go on websites and, you know, is this a scam? Before I put, you know, before I actually take part or participate in the transaction, I want to make sure, hey, is this something of value? That's no different from when someone hires you. They're looking for endorsements of people that can co-sign on your capabilities and performance. You know, and this is something that's going to be a powerful tool. In fact, this can be a, 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 a definite decision um, maker for some some, for some people um, that are making the hiring decisions. And I see it all the time, you know, experience and everything else goes out the window when you have someone that can speak on your behalf. Now, I've, I've people that may not have had the education or may not have the, 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 the set requirements in stone that the job was asking for, but hey, so-and-so over here said that they could do the job and I trust what they do because they've been a loyal employee and they've done outstanding work. So, hey, I'm going to give this person a try. I've seen people get jobs solely off of referrals. So you want to make sure that you have someone in your corner that's going to be an advocate for your performance and your work ethic. Let's go to the last slide. I know someone asked questions about interview questions. Um, they weren't very detailed. It just said interview questions. They weren't detailed on what they wanted to know about interview questions. So I kind of ran with it. And I wanted to talk about some of the most common interview questions that are asked and um, how to address them. So I said interview questions debunked. 
debunked. Excuse me. So are you ready? So let's look at the first question. I'm going to pop these out all at once so we can um, take it all in. First one is tell me about yourself. Everyone, no matter where you go to interview, it's really not an interview question. It's kind of a, you know, I'm trying to, first of all, you know, calculate your experience, your communication skills, trying to get a little bit, you know, more information about who you are. You know, so when someone tells you to tell them about yourself, you want to, you know, keep the, the, the answer very direct and transparent and you want to also make sure that this is something that you're going to talk about that's going to be relevant to the job which means that they don't want to hear about you know your four kids your grandmother your two you know your two cockle spaniels you know that's not the that's not what the question actually revolves around tell me about yourself means tell me about yourself on a professional platform how long you been in the business what you know how have you liked it so far? You can even talk about some of the changes that you've seen with throughout the industry and how you played a part in those changes, or if you did. You know, how much experience have you gained? You know, what what's your work environment been like as your past employer? So you want to, you know, and how were you able to handle that? So tell me about yourself is more about tell me about yourself on a, a professional platform. Second question most people, if not all employers, ask is, why are you looking for a job? You know, and, and this may not be um, something that's as direct if you're currently unemployed or laid off or, you know, that may be kind of a no-brainer. Well, hey, I was laid off. I'm out of work. And that's why I'm looking. So, you know, this may be more so asking for someone that may be, you know, trying to make a transition either in a new career or a new industry or they're trying to make a tradition, uh, uh, a transition as um, far as, you know, they're looking to make either a lateral move or take a promotion, something, and it, the question may be phrased differently. So why are you looking for a job? You know, and I really tell people to be honest, first of all, keep it brief, have a straightforward answer. You also want to avoid any type of negative statements about your ability um to either get along with others or anything negative about your past organization that may, you know, hey, you may have been laid off. Don't start talking about why you were laid off or who laid you off or, you know, you don't want to go into those type of um, details, you know, or you may be a person that, you know, hey, I'm looking for a new job because, you know, your job's about to fold or your position's about to get cut. You want to steer clear of any type of information that will put your past employer in a negative light, but you do want to be very transparent on why you're looking. It may be, hey, I'm looking to challenge myself. I'm looking for a new opportunity, a new challenge. You know, I may be looking because, hey, I lost my last job because of you know the economic downturn and now I'm looking to get back in this particular industry because this is what I love to do. You want to keep everything on a positive upbeat note. Next one, you haven't worked for a long time, why not? Again, this may be someone that's currently re-entering the job force, but may, you may be a stay-at-home mom or you may have been laid off a long time and decided to use that time to take a sabbatical and really wasn't gun-ho about looking for a new position. You know, so whatever your case may be, it may be that you've been out in school. Make sure, again, that you're being upfront and honest about that. There's many reasons why you not been you may have been out of work. You know, and, and you definitely want to have something to reflect in your resume what you were doing while you're out on that time. Because, you know, if you've been out of work for, you know, a large amount of time, you know, we're talking about years at a time, you know, they may consider it as a red flag, someone that may need training or someone's that skills may be dated. So you also want to emphasize if you've been out of work, but you've been actively doing something in that industry to make sure you're highlighting that as well. Now, I have some people that had took off to go back to school or I took off, you know, I was a stay at home mom. You know, they have legitimate reasons why they weren't working or I got laid off and, you know, and I decided to pursue X, Y, Z. I started to start my own company. You know, whatever the case may be, you want to make sure that you're upfront about that. Next one is what are you looking for? You know, and be ready to answer that question because they may talk about a position that you apply to, 
but they also may keep baby keeping you in mind for positions that may not even be posted online yet and may say hey this this, this person be a great fit for this you know so you want to be prepared to talk about the type of work that you're interested in doing and how your skills are going to meet the employer's needs so make sure that you're doing that as well Last but not least is my contact information. There's a survey after this workshop. If you're logged on, when you log off and if you jump off the line early, definitely take that survey. It's about 10 questions, or it is 10 questions, and it um, gives us some insight on what we can do to better or best and how we can um, improve our weekly workshops. We have a Memorial Day special going on. Um, it's 30% off all resume writing and editing services with that particular special you do get a free cover letter with that we are also are giving $75 off our hourly rate for our career co coaching and our market research rate you know this offer will end June the 1st um, after June the 1st we are increasing our prices and we haven't increased our prices for a while probably over a year so we're actually I'm going to be increasing our prices but we want to make sure that um, you can take advantage of this and actually um, get some percentage off and save some money before we even increase them. So we're giving the Memorial Day special. Um, it's going to be 30% off resume writing and editing service as well as $70 off your hour, our hourly rate. And this ends June the 1st at midnight. Well, thank you so much. If you have questions, I'm definitely going to open the line up. And again, if you jump off the line quick, um, please take the survey and I'm going to open the line up for any questions that you may have. And I know a lot of people on here are probably restless and tired because I know everyone had that three day weekend and we're back. You know, if you're working, you're, you're kind of like back to reality on Tuesday. It was a good little break, I can tell you that. Let's see, I don't see any questions as of now. Well, if you don't have any questions, but if you can think of some later on, this is my contact information, bbaggett at career-innovate.com. Definitely shoot me an email if you have a question that comes up that you'd like to be addressed. Um, if you want to speak with me or you like to schedule some type of one-on-one -on -one phone appointment, definitely um, go to our website, career-innovate.com. You can go to schedule a phone appointment. It's a big old orange icon on there that you just click, and it takes you to our calendar in which you can actually um, schedule your appointment. It asks for your email, your phone number, and the nature of the call, and you can fill all that information out so we'll know um, how to plan accordingly for a call. Um, our best way to reach me is either by setting up that phone appointment or through email. You know, even though I have a direct extension um, Normally, if I'm out in the field or putting together a workshop or I'm at a speaking engagement, I, I don't answer the phone. Um, you can leave a message. I definitely return it at my earliest convenience. But the best way to contact me to get that immediate answer to, or, or have your issue addressed it um, pretty much immediately would be through email or by setting up that phone appointment. Well, we're about at five till, so we did. Um, we are ending about five minutes early or so. Um, I want to thank everyone for giving me their time this holiday weekend. We do this again every Monday, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, on my email blast, I make sure I put in the, the time zone so um, many people understand that 7 o'clock our time, and it may be, you know, two, three hour difference depending on where you live. But I had a lot of people um, miss the workshop because they were waiting for 7 o'clock their time. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to that in the time zone. So it's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll see you again. Um, hopefully you'll log on with us next Monday, which is June the 1st um, from 7 to 8. And talk to you soon and enjoy your weekend. Have a good night.